Well, thank you everyone from the Wall Street Silver community. We have David Morgan from the Morgan Report, our special friend. We also have Lee Justo from the Wall Street Silver community. David, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing well, thank you. Awesome, awesome. Well, we're excited to have you back. Um, Lee, you want to get right into it. Let's get let's get some questions for David. Sure, David. I'm, I know you do these uh, quite frequently, um, so I know you've talked <laughs> about this stuff a lot over the past week is there something that you haven't spoken about that you've wanted to speak about and get a message out oh great lead question and yes there is there's something that i've only talked about i don't know how many times several times but i haven't talked about it in recent times and this is something that a lot of people kind of you know note but don't think about that's my opinion but 70 percent of the world's silver supply is a result of base metal mining. Wow. So 70% is what, you know, commonly referred to as the lion's share, the, the, the bulk of it. Mm -hmm. And it's a result of copper and zinc, lead, and even 13% of the silver supply as a result of gold mining. So here's the point that I wanna make. In almost all cases, not necessarily the gold miners, but the base metal miners, these are huge conglomerates. Mm -hmm. Broken Hill Properties, BHP Billington, RTZ, Rio Tinto, all of these huge conglomerates. <clears throat> and here's something that I don't want to say, but I haven't said in a long time, and it needs to be heard, is these large conglomerates could care less about the price of silver. And the reason is that they make so much money on, let's say, their copper and iron ore and lead, zinc, uh, whatever else they mine. I did a study probably almost two decades ago. I looked at RTZ and I put the price of silver at $100 an ounce. And I forget honestly where it was, Lee, at the time, but I think it was less than 15. And I looked at what it did to their bottom line and moved it like 1%. Now, some finance guy might come in and do that again and say, I'm wrong, it's 3%. <clears throat> but the point is, at that time, and even today, it means very little to them which is really unfortunate because here's what happens. Almost all of those large conglomerates that have 70% of the market that really don't care about the price, give it right away to the, the, the bullion banks. In other words, they say, you do the, the book work for us. We'll take a fee for allowing you to do so. I'm making that up, probably the case, we can't prove it. And we don't care, you know, you can manage it. So this gives them, the bullion banks and, central, and some of the other banks, direct access to the lion's share of the silver market, mm -hmm. and they can uh, take it and hypothecate it, rehypothecate it, at least to do whatever else. So that's something I haven't really emphasized. I mean, you know, you get some real outspoken stalwarts in the silver industry, and the primary silver industry is about 25% of the, of the market, meaning 70% is base metal miners, conglomerates, as I just said, 25% are your big primary silver producers like Pan American Silver, First Majestic, Keith Newmeyer being probably more outspoken than any of the CEOs in the silver industry. He and I think a lot alike. Uh, you've got, you know, endeavors. You've got many. I don't want to leave any out. But there aren't that many. You can count about really five, six real true silver producers that produce silver in size mm -hmm. that are part of that 20, 25%. The other 5%, where's that? It's recycled. You have actually probably a greater percentage than that. But So the point is, you've got this overhang. I wouldn't say overhang. Let me restate that. You've got this massive amount of silver that a lot of the entities that control it don't care about the price. And that's a problem because if it was valued for how valuable it is to a technological society, mm -hmm. let alone how it's valued as money, which is way higher than it is now, you might have a different outcome than we see. Regardless of all I said, it's not anything to give up on. It's not anything to worry about, really, because in the end, all things come true, which means the true value of silver will be recognized at some point. I have little doubt about that. But in the meantime, people just ask, well, how can it be this way? And the answer is there's two products. There's a paper product and a real product. And if you want to buy the real product, it's going to cost you more in fiat than buying some derivative product that's only a paper representation. It's that simple. So hopefully I got that off my chest. Hopefully it made sense. If you want to poke holes in it or 
revivify it or ask questions about it, Lee? Shoot. Yeah, so to, to, just to follow up on that. So you're basically saying silver's at the margin to all these big producers. Right. So they just forget about it. They let the bullion banks buy it. for. So do you feel that that is a factor in suppressing the, the price? I do. At, at spot, okay. I do because... First of all, they use it as a credit for their other mines. So it's a bookkeeping entry for them. So it's this shiny stuff that doesn't really mean that much to our company. And actually, in truth, in that case, it probably doesn't. But then they just shove it off to where it's most convenient, which would be to a bookkeeping entry. It's real silver. Right. Yep, but yep. Uh, the, the bullion banks get to put it on their books. And once it's on their books, look out. Because they're the ones that have the magic wand that can uh, do the alchemy to produce that real silver and turn it into many different forms if you follow my drift. <laughs> now, so what, what, what um, percentage of this silver at the margin, if you will, is total silver? I mean, because it's, it's, it has to be small compared to the, the current stock stockpiles throughout the world, correct? Well, you know, it's 70% of what's mined. So what's right. mined on an annual basis in the, the, you know, two studies, CPM and the World Silver Survey, they never agree exactly, but they're very close. So 800 million ounces, so 560 million ounces comes out of byproduct mining. Okay. Now, David, Sorry, what's, uh, what's your opinion on all of the news from the Perth Mint, US Mint, the unallocated, allocated uh, silver? What is your true take and opinion on that, David? Well, my opinion is that anyone that really invests in silver and understands not only the economic picture, but monetary history and why silver and gold are important knows you should have it. Mm -hmm. And to have a claim on it is not having it. Like I can show you out of my desk drawer, I can't pull it out easily a silver certificate. And that is a representation for a silver dollar, but is not a silver dollar. And at one time it was fully exchangeable. I could walk into any Federal Reserve Bank, put it on the counter and get a silver dollar for it. It's invalid after 1968. My point is a lot of people still have certificates from Canadian banks, uh, other banks throughout Europe, uh, even in Argentina, you can get them. And they are very nice looking pieces of paper that are engraved really, really elaborately. And they've probably got maybe your name on it or your company name on it. Mm -hmm. And it says on that piece of paper that you have so many ounces of 999 foreign silver. But that is just a claim on it. It isn't the actual thing. So I'm being a bit long-winded, Ivan, to make the point that anyone and everyone that has a unallocated account should switch to allocated immediately or sell the unallocated for whatever fiat currency it brings to you, whether you're Australian, Canadian, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Get on the phone and immediately call a dealer that you can trust and buy real Absolutely. physical. That would be my, that, you know, that, that just almost doesn't need to be said, but I certainly want to say it because a lot of people have a false sense of security mm -hmm. because it's a big bank and their bank accounts there and every check they ever wrote cleared and, Every check they ever put in got deposited. And why wouldn't I trust the bank with my silver? Well, I put several things up on Twitter recently. I had kind of a Twitter frenzy last weekend. <laughs> and I put up UBS frauded people, Morgan Stanley frauded people. Yeah. Some of the mints in the past have closed down. Tolving. I got a lot of flack. I used to never recommend Tolving even though they were the cheapest price. But if you read the 10 rules of silver investing that I wrote, yeah. the reason I said, don't get a raw deal from your dealer in bold was that I don't want anyone getting the lowest price and not getting their metal. And that's happened over and over and over again. Does that mean you should pay the highest premium to get your metal? No, it doesn't mean that. But it also means if you're buying something at spot, you better question that. If you're buying something that's stored for free, you better question that. So. Yeah. Probably got it off my chest, Ivan, but I mean, <laughs> I like it's it. common sense stuff that people overlook and I don't know why, but they do. No, that's, that's pure common sense. Now, Lee, you want to hit him with another question? Yeah. Well, just to follow up on that, what, what if you're a high net worth individual and you don't want to keep all your precious metals in your home, in a safe, wherever, how best to allocate that? I mean, are you, are you someone who thinks that you should deposit it in different countries, use an outside service? I'm going to tell you a story. It's, it's a true story, but it's a story. So it's hearsay. I can't prove it. But uh, at the bottom of the 2008 crisis, I got I have a consultations. I do consultations. 
I took it off the website because I'm so busy right now. I'm getting like three interviews a day instead of three a week. And I want to concentrate on my main purpose, which is to, you know, write my research for the people that pay me for that. But I have for years done consultations. So I got a call from a banker, but this wasn't any banker. This wasn't your banker for all of uh, name a big bank, uh, Santander, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. for, you know, for, for a country. I mean, this guy was like way up there. And he said, I wanted to buy this much silver. <clears throat> and it was a very large number. Jamie Dimon? And it wasn't quite <laughs> at that level, but pretty close. Okay. I'm and sure he knows what to do with it. <laughs> so I said, well, first thing I said was, why did you call me? And he said, because, you know, I trust you. How, how can you trust me? I'm some guy on the internet, you know? And you know, we, he didn't say we have our ways. He just said, I trust you or something like that. He was, he had done whatever dil due diligence he felt was required in order to make, you know, the consultation call. Mm -hmm. So I said, do you want it domestic? Do you want it, you know, in the States or not? That was the next question. He said, I want it in the States. And then he said this, I don't want to see it. I don't want to touch it. All I want to know is it's there. It's guaranteed that it's there. And I want to buy this amount. Can you help me? I said, yes, I can. I happen to have the cell phone number of John Potts that founded the Delaware Depository. And that uh, vault, I've been through the entire thing that uh, standing right next to John, he walked me through the whole facility. Here's his cell phone number. Tell him you got the information from me and he will do the transaction for you. Mm -hmm. And so that 30 minute call that he paid me, I don't know, 250 bucks for lasted about 10 minutes. But that was a banker way up the chain that knew we were at the bottom of the market, the financial crisis 2008. Probably was a 5% position, you know? I mean, it yeah. was, a, you know, be more than my life savings. But for him, it probably was, you know, a small percentage of his net worth. But I thought that was so interesting. He said, I want it domestic. I don't want to see it. I don't want to touch it. I want to be guaranteed it's there. I want to know who to store it with. And that's what I gave him. So kind of a cool story. Why? Uh, I kept Why him anonymous. So? so I'll just leave it there. But uh, there are people like that. And I actually, again, I, I can just go on that I had three similar, not quite that size, but mat, but whale size at the bottom in March of 2020, 2020, when we hit that $12 level, these people would say again, anonymously, hey, I've got a million dollars in the bank. Huh. I've run this company for you know 25 years. I'm scared to death to have that much cash in the bank. Mm -hmm. And I never bought gold before, you know, what do I do? You know, so uh, there, you know, so that's it. I've answered the question, but, I, but it is uh, interesting. And, you know, yeah, you can buy it and store it. You just gotta be darn sure who you do it with. Yeah. You gotta have a good source. You gotta trust everything. Lee, do you have a question? So I mean, it sounds like uh, precious metals is a panic buy for some of these uh, high net worth individuals. Well, at that 2008, I don't know if it was a panic buy. It sure was perfect timing. And on these other three individuals, uh, you know, more recently in the bottom in 2020, all of them, you know, no, none of them knew each other. It happened over about a 10-day yep. you know, period. But it's all basically the same story. I got a lot of cash. I'm worried about the banking system. I've never bought precious metals. Can you help me? Where, where, where do you see or what, what triggers do you see uh, for precious metals to just start going skyrocketing. I mean, is it a collapse in the equities market, the bond market, all, all those things, uh, the collapse in the dollar? I mean, do you see anything in the immediate horizon that could trigger it? Well, you know, I have to kind of cop out on this question, Lee. It's a, some black swan and maybe one I don't know of. I mean, all okay. the things you mentioned make sense. It's really hard to forecast because it's a psychological event. Yeah, no doubt. You see that, you know, flock of birds flying in a perfect V formation and all of a sudden they take a hard turn to the right. There's no rhyme or reason to why they do that. Yep. And human be behavior is very similar. It's, you know, why do you all of a sudden decide precious metals is worth having when you've badmouthed it for 20 years or whatever? So I don't know, but all those make sense. I'm not looking for any particular thing. I am looking for sort of a almost an immediate after effect on, um, let me explain. Once the run begins, mm -hmm. it is going to gather momentum quickly. 
Yeah. And as that momentum gathers, it will get to where it's lodging that, you know, exit out of the theater as a metaphor. And once that happens, you'll see probably side deals go on and like the eBay type situations where yeah. maybe the normal premium is, I don't know, make up a big number that's existed 30%. And it goes to 40 or 45 or 50%. Because at some point when people want, you know, out of cash, and into metal, they'll do just about anything to get there. And uh, I see that coming at some point. I don't know if it's a year away, two years away. I doubt it's more than three. It could be three weeks, it could be three months. I really don't know. I, I have two personal stories. I used to trade um, down on Wall Street and one of the guys I was trading with was from Turkey. And at the time, the Turkish lira just crapped out and his parents got destroyed financially from it. <laughs> You know, and then I, I have a, one of my best friends I grew up with. Uh, he was running a school in Argentina, and they actually had to close the school because the the parents couldn't pay for the school anymore because the, the currency collapsed. So, you know, events happen so quickly, and I guess, like you said, fundamentals in the precious metal markets have been positive for them for decades, but it all changes on mass psychology. So, do you do you see the awakening happening now, David? Like in the past couple of months with everything happening in the news, the mints or, or have you already seen all this before or this awakening with everything going on now? Like, what do you feel? What's your true feeling? Yeah. My feeling is that, uh, the first time that we met, I had the feeling that things had changed significantly because the whole idea of precious metals has to do with education or awareness or a combination of awareness and being educated about it. And this is where, I certainly never given up. I mean, I've gone to a lot of conferences on my own cost, which is not a big deal, but you know, basically anytime I was asked to speak anywhere, I did it. Very few did I ever turn down. Even if it was four people, I felt the message was that important that I would do it. Yeah. So when I saw the Wall Street Silver come and you reached out, I had a feeling very deep that this is it. It's going to take a new group of people primarily young people, which is really what it's, it's meant for everyone, of course. Yeah, of course. But, you know, you guys have been handed a raw deal by our generation. I mean, there's been a few very solid voices trying to get things back on track, telling the truth and trying to make people aware, but they're put pushed off to the sidelines for the most part. Mm -hmm. So my feeling is that you started something maybe bigger than you even realize. And I think there's an adjunct with that, and that is the digital currency phenomenon. Because once people understand the power of having a precious metals backed digital currency that they can buy anywhere in the world at a world price. So you're not having to pay a 17% VAT if you're in, let's say, certain parts of Europe yeah. uh, or a big premium if you're in Japan because they really don't sell at retail, that you can go on your phone and you can buy it in three minutes or less and have a vaulted supply of silver or gold or both and have access to it 24 seven anywhere in the world, that's going to change the dynamic. So going back to my initial opening with Lee, when the cryptocurrency world that's precious metals backed gets those RTZ contracts for that silver that they could care less about and doesn't have to book it as far as hypothecate it, rehypothecate it, and really sticks it in the vault and issues digital silver and gold against it. And now you have a free market because there's nothing that's preventing it from going down in price or up in price other than what the market determines because there's no funny business going on. So you're vaulting silver somewhere where it's acting like it should. It's a solid element valued by mankind, womankind, as something that's really important <clears throat> that holds its value over time and is very undervalued at this point in time. So I think there's a shift there that no one really sees. It's a combination of your youth your enthusiasm your ability to seek the truth combined with the new modern money that's basically going to be digital based that has combines both the electronic platforms with a real precious metal or metals and that is going to have a huge impact is it going to be tomorrow no but i think it will be significantly changed within a couple of years well david I'll, i have a I'll, question I'll, for you oh go I'll, ahead uh, i'll tell you david we we appreciate you a lot um, the most important thing is, I know I've asked you this before and getting out a message uh, to the youth, but 
what is your like real 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 message to someone who has no no interest in in paper dollars anymore who's leaving bitcoin because there's a lot of people in wall street silver now they're posting they're selling their bitcoin and they're buying silver so what would be your message or guidance to people who are still in bitcoin and cryptos and stock f for them to see the real truth pretty tough i mean look i'm free market which means free market of ideas you know yeah. if i can't convince you with an argument then uh Maybe it's not the right time, place, or condition. Mm. Sometimes what you say has a lot of power five years out. Sometimes it has a lot of power five minutes out. Sometimes it has power, you know, two generations out. So, but I would say go to the, my, you know, one of my favorite videos they made on the matrix, yes. you know, and that is, look, you got an option here. You can take the blue pill and I hold up the Zimbabwe blue currency and go back to sleep. Or you can take the silver coin and see the truth. And remember, all I'm promising you is the truth, yeah. nothing more. So that's a metaphor. For some of the Bitcoin people, uh, I'll say this. I think this would be the best way to say it. When Bitcoin started really going on its first exponential flight, <clears throat> I was in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, at the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. And of course, part of my speech was on Bitcoin because it was everybody's talking about it. And I said, based on my knowledge of markets, it's going exponential and it's got a lot further to go. I don't know how high it's going to go. When it hit 17,000, I recommended at the Anarchapoco conference, which is a couple months later, or just before the Anarchapoco conference on an interview like this, probably a week before, mm -hmm. that you might consider taking some of those Bitcoin profits and putting them in silver. Well, when I got to the Anacapoco conference, a man about your age came up to me with you know, small smiles. Because I think, I don't even know, I, I don't follow Bitcoin like I follow silver, but I think it got to 19,000. But he sold it at 17,000, put the proceeds in silver. And silver was probably 17 or something like that at the time and was very, very happy. So, you know, I think generally what I can say with a lot of authority is, don't put all of your eggs in one basket. And if you do watch the basket very closely. So if you got everything in Bitcoin and it's gone for from for you, you know, 10,000 to 55,000 or whatever it is today. And everything is there and you're watching the basket closely, don't get too greedy. You know, take something off the table. You've more than, you know, 10 bags your money. Take half of that money off. The, oh, it's going to 100 Maybe it is going to 100,000, yeah. but maybe it's going to correct from 55,000 down to 20,000, yeah. especially a market like Bitcoin that's very, very volatile. So, my idea is simple you know, take some of those profits and bank it. You couldn't bank it in a better place, in my opinion, than the physical silver market, especially when we have this 31st of March coming up where we're all going to make a little bit of contribution to our own well being. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We love silver. That's the most important thing. <laughs> uh, Lee? Uh, David, do um, you have any thoughts on, on Basel and what's coming up in June? And yeah, I was asked that uh, interview recently. Uh, I think it's really a, a non, non -event. issue. Yeah. yeah. Basically, I studied quite a, not a lot, but deep enough, some of the better brain trusts in the business. Uh, Keith Weiner being one of them, he and I are friends. He's a pretty bright guy. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'd already for was forming my opinion. And after I read what he wrote, I said, yeah, that's it. Basically, right now, the bank's using it as not a tier one asset. They can hypothecate it at whatever it is, 50%. When it's 100%, when it's the same as cash, they can hypothecate it even more. So they'll probably do more dilution, oh, okay. not less. So it's kind of the opposite of what everybody's all foaming at the mouth about. I think it's a non-event. I could be wrong. If I'm wrong, I'll come back on the show and say I was wrong, but I do doubt you, it. Do you think that the central banks are going to be pegging their digital currencies to, to precious metals, or do you think they're going to just try and decouple them completely? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I put a lot of thought into that one. And I've kind of come around to a, a change of thought. So for a very long time, I said that the banks will have to put gold into the equation. And then the more work I did and wrote, you know, for people that pay me, what exactly what I was thinking at the time. And for the last several months, I said, it's pretty obvious what the WEF wants. World Economic Forum wants a non-backed, 
uh, modern money theory, infinite production, digital currency globally that you can uh, track, trace, and tax everybody on the planet. That's what they want. That's their goal. Yeah. So then I rethought that, and that's pretty clear to me. And I went back to what I was heard from my friend Bill Holter. Bill and I got to know each other pretty good on a German trip that we made to speak in Germany one time and really spent a lot of time. And he thinks a lot like I do and vice versa. Don't agree on everything. That, but, And I thought what he and Jim Sinclair have talked about again and again, it's that there's going to be a reset, it will fail, and there'll be another reset and it will succeed. Mm, right. And the short story is the first one will be unbacked and it will fail or not be accepted. So they'll have to move the gold. So I'm more in that camp right now. Okay. Uh, I think that it will be rejected or maybe even the interbank system will say, wait a minute, we're kidding ourselves. Modern money theory, we can go to infinity with no repercussions or whatever the backlash is, the feedback is. Um, so that's my take. I think they're going to try to just trust us. It's just as good as your old bank account. Here's your new one. It's called the Fed coin. It's complete fraud, but smile anyway. Wow. <laughs> That's that's incredible though. Like if there is a double reset coming, then that makes sense. They'll come out with a digital currency. No one will trust them whatsoever. We will start waking up people to silver and gold and real uh, metals, and then people will start going to the governments and saying, "We want this, this, and this," and backed by precious metals. And then the government will have no choice. That's it. Wow. Please? Can I follow up on the Great Reset thing here? Sure. Um, it, from my perspective, I don't think many people really want this great reset to be imposed upon us. Do you think that buying physical silver and gold is a way to, to stymie their plans? Well, it's certainly a way to have a decentralized monetary asset. I mean, everyone brags about Bitcoin, about how decentralized it is and anonymous, but it really isn't as anonymous as most people think. No. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's nothing more anonymous than, you know, a one-tenth ounce gold coin worth, what, 180 bucks that you can, uh, you know, trade with or a silver coin worth these days, 28 US or 20, whatever, 30, I'll call it. So that is the best form and it's physical. I mean, I cannot hand you a Bitcoin. I can get next to you with my phone and your phone and we can make a transaction and we don't have to be together, but I can do that. But without an electronic platform, you have nothing. Yep. And that goes to, you know, well, wait a minute, David, you said you like the blockchain precious metals currency. And I do. But I also call that an adjunct to what I would call your core holding. Mm -hmm. if your core holding was, I'll make up a number of thousand, a thousand ounces. I wouldn't put any more than maybe 20% you know, on an electronic platform. I'd have the 80%, you know, where I knew where it was. What do you like, David? 10 ounce bars, 100 ounce bars? What are you currently stacking? Well, you know, I started out like everybody. What I've always taught, and I haven't said it actually in a while, is the best to start, junk especially if you're in the States, but could be anywhere is by, you know, it's referred to as junk silver or constitutional silver, 1964 or earlier 90% silver coins because they're barterable. I mean, dimes are worth quite a bit more than a dime, yeah. but they're easy to stack and they're very easy to recognize. They're very impossible really to counterfeit, uh, but they're cumbersome. And then, uh, so once that's accomplished, it depends on your net worth. Uh, you know, one ounce rounds or one ounce government coins are probably the second choice. After that, you know, 10 ounce bars are great. The bigger you go up, the more you have to be more correct in your decision making. Yeah. So. If you could only afford 500 ounces, it'd be much smarter to have, you know, a bag of silver or equivalent, whatever that would buy, you know, buy you instead of five 100 ounce bars. So if you had 500 ounces of silver and five 100 ounce bars, it might stack neatly. It might be easy to, tr tr you know, get to. But every time you make a choice to turn it into fiat or barter it for something or trade it or take a loan against it or whatever, you have to make a pretty big decision. Yeah. Whereas if you have five 100 ounce, you know, uh, silver maples, now you've got 500 independent actions. Not that you couldn't put 100 together and make a decision with 100 silver ounces, but it gives you a lot more flexibility. So you really want flexibility in your financial affairs. Now, if you're a multi-zillionaire, you know, a hundred ounce bar to you would be like a 10, a dime to me kind of thing. So 
Now, uh, what more can we do, uh, David, for your guidance for Wall Street Silver to wake up the masses? What more can you give us advice or tips on uh, for us to do? Well, I think to study, uh, you know, just continue to educate yourselves amongst your group. And, you know, I think this happy Hawaiian has done a lot of yes, uh, good information. He reached out to me and uh, we had a very long conversation. I won't give his real name. And for a young man, he got it really right uh, on a lot of stuff. There were a few points that I, you know, tweaked him up on a little bit. Um, there's still a couple of things that he might have a slightly off, but the main message that he's given out is very powerful. And to come up with some of those ideas on his own are very important. He's oh. incredible. Like the 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 every time he posts a due diligence or anything, anytime I see it, and I even tell him put it right to the top because uh, it's incredible information. And we're if he's watching, thank you, Happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my shout out to him as well. In fact, I'm going to have to really study his latest one, which is several pages, and I got to get some more ink to put in my printer. I want to print it out and highlight it. There you go. I'll probably be going through some of that um, with my friend in London, uh, Renegade Inc. It's called. It's actually the producer of the movie The Four Horsemen, mm -hmm. uh, and that's something I would recommend. Um, it's Where can on my we watch website. it? Huh? Where can we watch it? Yeah, just go to my YouTube channel. Just type in, go to YouTube and type in the Morgan Report. When you're on my channel, there'll be an ad. Just turn it off. <laughs> And then uh, across the top, they'll have, you know, videos, popular videos, whatever it says. About the middle, it says community. Yeah. Click on community. And those are videos that I put up that I think are of special importance to get. And a lot of them don't have to do with silver. I mean, they have to do with uh, food production or socioeconomic problems or, you know, a lot of things. Well, I've just put the uh, Four Horsemen film up there. Nice. So it's Wonderful. extremely easy to find. So if you just go to the community on my YouTube channel, scroll down about three, you'll see the four horsemen. It's an hour and a half. And it's a great one for someone that knows really what's going on because it kind of refreshes everything. Give you some points that maybe you never thought about. You can connect dots even further. And for those that are kind of on the sidelines that are just kind of waking up and saying, I don't know, I'm not sure. It's done in such a way it doesn't bash anybody. You know, they don't have to put someone down to build themselves up. I hate that. Exactly. They just call it like it is and you decide for yourself. So I think, uh, so there's one. And that's about it. I mean, you know, I'm one of many. I'm glad that uh, I'm a messenger and not the message. I mean, the message is to be true to yourself, understand what's real and what isn't. You know, I used to close out every video with be real, buy real, get real, you know? I love that. Lee, do you have any last uh, questions I, for David? I do not. I, David, I just want to say it's been an honor speaking with you. Yes. Uh, we we'll look forward to more conversations in the future. Yes, David. Very good. Well, you brought out a couple of old stories. I always enjoy <laughs> telling some of them. So thank you so much. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, from the Wall Street Silver community. We have the Morgan Report, David Morgan. Uh, and again, what? where can we exactly contact? Do you have a website or just the YouTube channel? No, I have a website. That's the best thing is to get on our opt-in list. It's free for the free newsletter. I do a weekly uh, perspective, which is an overview of the markets. And I always talk gold and silver at the end. It's usually 15 minutes long. And you get that by just going to themorganreport.com, put a first name and an email address, verify it's you and you're not a bot. <laughs> and you're on our mailing list and everything I do, I'll send to you for awesome. free. Awesome. Beautiful. Well, we appreciate you so much, David. Hopefully we can speak to you soon uh, when more things develop. I, I know some more things will develop. Uh, and thank you, everyone from the Wall Street Silver community.